Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here on flight day 23 of the Artemis One mission. We're here today to talk about Splashdown coming up on December 11th. And to join us, I have Mike Serafin, Artemis One mission manager, Judd Freeling, Artemis One ascent and entry flight director, Jim Geffrey, Orion vehicle integration manager, and Melissa Jones on the phone, the landing and recovery director. We're going to allow our uh, participants here to provide some opening remarks and then we'll get into the question and answer session. A reminder if you're on the phone to please press star one to raise your hand and ask a question and star two if your question has been asked uh, and you need to withdraw it. But first we will start with those opening remarks and I'll toss it over to you Mike. All right, thank you Leah. Well, good afternoon and thank you for continuing to follow our program in the Artemis One mission. We are on flight day 23 of our 26 day uncrewed flight test. The mission continues to proceed well and along the, uh, the planned mission profile and we are setting up for Earth reentry and splashdown and recovery of the Orion capsule following a skip reentry on December the 11th. Uh, at present, we are on track to have a fully successful mission with some bonus objectives that we've uh, achieved along the way. And uh, on entry day, uh, we will realize our priority one objective, which is to um, demonstrate the vehicle lunar reentry conditions, as well as our priority three objective, which is to retrieve the spacecraft. Uh, since I was here to speak with you last, the uh, mission management team has met daily and we will meet again um, on Friday and Saturday. Uh, on Monday, December the 5th, uh, uh, I, I was here last and um, we met again on Tuesday, December the 6th for an hour and a half. Uh, we did get an outbrief of the anomaly resolution team uh, associated with the power conditioning and distribution uh, unit, um, funnies that we've been seeing associated with the latching current limiters. Uh, we did approve some additional testing of the uh, of the spacecraft to gather additional data on the um, on the uh, anomalous behavior that we've that we've seen, and that testing has been completed, and we and we actually may um, uh, have a uh, uh, additional test um, in the in the in the coming days. We also saw some degraded behavior um, on um, on Tuesday associated with one of the phased array antennas, which is used for uh, communications and tracking of the spacecraft back to Earth through the deep space network on the crew module, module adapter, uh, specifically phased array antenna number one. Uh, the antenna is performing, but it has uh, low performance and is causing some um, periodic comm dropouts when we're on that antenna. On Wednesday, December the 7th, we met for an hour and 15 minutes roughly. Uh, we um, uh, talked again through the uh, power conditioning and distribution unit um, test results uh, that were approved on, on the prior day as well as the anomaly uh, res resolution team out brief and uh, continued to, uh, to understand what our engineering teams were finding as well as our operations teams were finding through the, um, the additional troubleshooting on the spacecraft's power system. Uh, in parallel with that, our recovery teams deployed from Naval Base San Diego on Wednesday, December the 7th, and they're currently at sea, and you'll hear that from our, our recovery director, uh, Melissa Jones, here shortly. Today, uh, we met for right at, at about an hour, and it was our pick'em day. Uh, we, we decided our landing site and our, and our entry flight director, Judd Freeling, and our uh, recovery director, Melissa Jones, came in with a recommendation and um, of consideration associated with the, the uh, landing site selection as a cold front uh, that is moving into the Southern California area um, and off the coast in the Pacific. So that was factored in, into the uh, landing site selection. Uh, primary factors associated with landing site selection, we have spacecraft design limits, we have recovery operations safety, and then we have test objectives associated with imagery, um, associated with some of the uh, jettisoned items and parachute deploy sequence. So those were factored into the decision that you'll hear more about uh, when Judd speaks. Uh, as we start wrapping up the mission, um, I want to thank the team um, and, and specifically the mission management team. Um, when you look at the uh, the program that we have, which is a space launch system rocket managed out of the Marshall Space Flight Center, our exploration ground systems team uh, managed out of the Kennedy Space Center uh, for uh, both the uh, launch operations, the uh, vehicle processing prior to flight, and then um, the uh, recovery operations. And then you look 
at the activities out of the Johnson Space Center with the Orion spacecraft team and our flight operations team. Uh, there's no one center and there's no one program and no one person. Uh, it is a team effort. And um, we have a diverse team of skills. Uh, we have system designers, we have flight programs, we have engineering technical authorities, we have safety um, experts, and uh, as well as our, um, our uh, industry and international partners involved. And if we could pull up a couple of photos, uh, these are uh, just a few uh, uh, shots through the course of our mission management team meetings. This one occurred uh, during the return power flyby and we were, uh, you can see in the screen in the background, we were um, about to witness uh, the earth rise together as a team. We had it live streamed in and, and we paused for, for about a minute there. The room was just absolutely silent. As, as we absorbed uh, the uh, the Earthrise moment, it, it was it was my Earthrise too. As as part of the Ar Artemis generation, um, I was I think I was four months old when the, when the Apollo 17 left uh, the moon. So uh, that was that was my Earthrise moment uh, as well. Um, there uh, there we are. That's the uh, Secretary Joe Williams sitting next to me in the course of the meeting, and and some of our our. Um, Cross program systems integration team and our and our uh, engineering tech, technical authority sitting in the background. If we go to the next photo, um, this is um, Zeb Scoville, one of the MMT members from uh, Flight Operations Directorate, um, weighing in on a conversation. And if we go to the next next photo, um, this is Chris Edelin, uh, who you've seen come talk to you. He's the head of our uh, Orion engineering team in the mission evaluation room and. To, um, to the right of the screen there is, is our lead flight director, Rick LeBrode, and then we have the uh, uh, NASA Engineering and Safety Center lead, Ben Himini, in there. So it is a diverse team. Again, um, it represents uh, multiple NASA centers. We have our international partners. We have our, um, our industry partners uh, all on that team, and it, and it was an honor and a privilege to lead that team. Uh, through a number of pre-planned decision gates, as well as uh, some of the some of the issues that we that we had to work through. Um, in parallel with all that, we continue to prepare for Artemis II and later missions. We have production of the core stage on, ongoing at the Mishu Assembly Facility. We have boosters that have been prepared at the Promontory Facility in Utah. Uh, we have our uh, upcoming Orion spacecraft in preparation at the Operations and Checkout Facility at the Kennedy Space Center, as well as uh, later service modules past uh, Artemis II um, in, in production in Europe with our uh, European Space Agency partners. But we're also getting the uh, mobile launcher ready. If we could roll the video from uh, the rollback activities uh, that uh, are occurring presently, the uh, mobile launcher that uh, Artemis One was was uh, launched from uh, is, is headed back from the launch pad to the vehicle assembly building. Uh, if we could roll that video, please. Uh, here is the uh, the mobile launcher uh, moving down the crawler way. Um, when you can see the peak, uh, clean pad concept in the background, and our engineers walking along um, just to check the health of the uh, of the crawler itself. And and there is uh, a lovely vacant mobile launcher. Uh, the the uh, 322 foot tall Artemis vehicle is missing, and we're going to take it back to the vehicle assembly building, and it should arrive there uh, late today. Uh, we'll park it outside and then uh, bring it inside the vehicle assembly building to um, complete some of the uh, inspection activities. But the, the mobile launcher is on track to be ready for Artemis II. So, all that said, um, you know we we are wrapping this mission up. Uh, we are not letting our guard down. Uh, we have some hard stuff ahead of us. We have dynamic flight phases, and uh, and uh, we are encouraged by the progress that we've made and the path that we're on. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it back to you, Leah. Thank you, Mike. And I'll turn it over to Judd Freeling, ASEN, Entry Flight Director for Artemis One. Thanks, Leah. Uh, let's see, as, as Mike said, uh, we're, we're on the hope stretch, but uh, we're not quite there, so we still have some critical events that we're, we're looking to perform. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be checking out the crew module uh, reaction control system, so we'll pressurize that system uh, by firing some uh, uh, pyrotechnic valves uh, to make sure everything is healthy in that system for, uh, for use when we, uh, we come in for entry. Uh, and then uh, Saturday, we have our, uh, our fifth uh, return trajectory correction burn, uh, followed by then, of course, Sunday, we've got uh, our sixth uh, return tra trajectory uh, burn, followed by the entry and, and uh, entry interface at uh, 11.20 uh, a.m. Central Time. 
Uh, let's see, uh, let's put up the graphic there. So this is the track that, um, that uh, Orion will be uh, following. Uh, at the very bottom of the, the, uh, the chart there, you'll see the entry interface. That's again at 400,000 feet. Um, go all the way through uh, skip apogee, which you can see is kind of in the middle of that uh, um, uh, chart uh, to, uh, to our landing site. Now, uh, as Mike mentioned, our, uh, our landing site uh, would normally be uh, in the San Diego area. Uh, we also have a northern weather and alternate site that uh, we could have chosen uh, that's just a north of our, our nominal site. Uh, but both of those uh, are forecast to be uh, no-go for weather uh, constraints uh, due to a cold front that will be moving in right around the time that uh, we have a splashdown. So uh, as a consequence, we've decided to move uprange of this track uh, by 300 nautical miles. So um, if, you, if that line scooted uh, uh, downward uh, to the south by 300 nautical miles, uh, we'd be uh, landing right off um, uh, the uh, Guadalupe Island off the uh, coast of uh, Baja. So that's uh, 300 uh, nautical miles uprange. Uh, if you go to the next uh, 3D version, you can kind of see what that looks like from the side view uh, with the skip entry. Uh, it'll show you. Uh, the, the the long track the long arc that will take along the uh, you know the the the, the Earth's surface uh, you can barely make out that we're doing that skip apogee um, uh, or during the uh, the uh, the skip and then the apogee it it all looks really uh, tiny compared to the the, the size of the Earth uh, but that will end up a little short of what that uh, landing site says you know again at that uh, alternate weather site that we'll be doing south uh, our nominal. Entry range uh, for this would have been uh, 3,500 nautical miles. Of course, you take 300 miles off that, it will be uh, about 3,200 nautical miles, well within uh, our capability and well within our test objectives. Uh, let's see, next slide is, uh, is a little close up on what that skip entry sequence looks like. Um, about 20 minutes before we hit uh, entry interface, we will separate the crew module from the service module. Uh, all of that, the, uh, the, the power and propulsion system from the service module will no longer need and, and that will uh, burn up in the Pacific. Uh, we'll, do, we'll perform a raise maneuver from the crew, crew module and that, uh, that shallows out our uh, trajectory with respect to the, uh, the service module, so it gives us a little bit more lift. In our trajectory, we'll proceed down through the, uh, the bottom of that, that arc there uh, and then start modulating our uh, lift vector back upwards so that we do that script profile and also modulate our energies such that, such that we, we, uh, we target that uh, weather and alternate site that, uh, that I spoke about previously. Uh, We'll come in uh, uh, later on in the trajectory. We'll, we'll uh, deploy the forward bay cover, which will expose the drogues and the chutes. We'll blow, uh, deploy the, the drogues and chutes, and of course, then splash down. Uh, the next slide shows a little bit more detail of those uh, uh, chute deploy sequences. Uh, so you can see the uh, forward bay cover there um, around uh, you know 35,000 feet or so uh, starts to deploy. At least the chutes come out to deploy that. Uh, and then we'll start on our drogues around that 24,000 feet, uh, all the way to about uh, 6,000 uh, or, or so, 6,800 feet or so, uh, when we deploy uh, our uh, jettison the, the the drogues, and then we'll deploy the mains uh, about uh, 5,300 feet or so, uh, all the way uh, down to uh, 1,500 feet, and at that that point we will actually uh, start uh, controlling the roll of the capsule so that we. Uh, hit the, the water at the same angle, at, at, at the proper angle, uh, into the wind, right? So uh, we have the, the least amount of load on the structure. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, I think that's the, only, that's the last slide I have to go there. Uh, as I mentioned, when we, when we uh, splash down, we will actually be in the water for about two hours. We have some uh, flight test objectives to complete, and that two-hour mark, uh, it's essentially uh, a soak back uh, uh, flight test objective. We're testing all of the heat that has come uh, and, and been generated on the capsule. We want to make sure that we characterize uh, the, the, how that's going to affect the interior of the capsule. And I think Jim will probably talk a little bit more about that in his, uh, his presentation. But uh, essentially that two hours is, is for that objective. And once uh, we, we finish with that objective, uh, we'll hand over the uh, capsule to uh, Melissa Jones and uh, and then uh, she'll start her recovery process. So with that, Leah, back over to you.
Thank you, Judd, and I will turn it over to Jim Geffrey. Thank you, Leah. The Artemis, mission, Artemis One mission continues to go very well. Uh, we've collected a, an immense amount of data characterizing system performance from the, the power system, the propulsion, GNC, and so far, the flight control team has downlinked over 140 gigabytes of engineering and imagery data that the team is already analyzing to help not only understand the performance on Artemis One, but play forward for all, all subsequent missions. Our propulsion system has performed very well. We're on target to hit our uh, very narrow entry corridor um, on, on Sunday, and so we're on target to, to achieve our landing site. But as Mike said earlier, our, our top Artemis One mission priority is still ahead of us, which is to demonstrate the guidance system of Orion, as well as the heat shield performance as, as we return from 25,000 miles per hour uh, returning from the moon. We collected some really great data as we flew by the moon a couple days ago. And if we could bring up the first imagery, uh, I wanted to show, show this one. Uh, this image was taken by Orion's onboard optical <coughs> navigation system. This camera is used as a secondary means to identify where Orion is in the solar system by taking images of the moon and Earth. And we were able to capture a really great image here, uh, both the Apollo 14 and 15 landing sites. You could see the Fra Mora site uh, of Apollo 14, as well as Hadley for Apollo 15 with the Copernicus crater in the, the lower middle portion of the, the view. Apollo 12 is, is just off the frame. This for me is a, a great reminder that here we are on the 50th anniversary, anniversary of Apollo 17. We're continuing the exploration adventure started by Apollo and Artemis 1 is, is continuing that. The next chart I wanna show is, is the skip entry sequence. As Judd described earlier, uh, this is a novel technique for a human exploration spacecraft that allows the vehicle to fly all the way back off the west coast of, the, uh, of North America. So a few interesting things about this uh, trajectory is, um, first of all, it's about 20, 20 minutes from entry interface to splashdown. The astronauts on board for Artemis II would experience around uh, four Gs at, at the peak um, acceleration point. That's similar to what astronauts experience returning from low Earth orbit. So well within the, the human uh, capability for a deconditioned crew member. Once we splash down, we're also gonna collect the additional data that Judd mentioned. We'll see how the heat soaks back into the crew module and how that affects the temperature inside and um, make sure that it stays within uh, crew limits. So we're very excited here on, on Sunday, but we, uh, we still have the, uh, the top Ar Artemis I mission priority ahead of us, as well as demonstrating the recovery of the capsule. Thanks, Jim. And joining us on the phone is Melissa Jones, Landing and Recovery Director. Good afternoon. I'm excited to be joining you guys from the USS Portland. As you heard, we've decided on a landing site for Artemis One mission, and the ship is making its way to that location now. Um, on board the ship, we are working with our Navy counterparts to prepare to recover the Orion once it splashes down on December 11th. And our plan for that is to get to the landing site 24 hours ahead of splashdown, where we will start launching weather balloons to gather data for reentry. Um, we man the control center about five hours before splashdown. Um, and prior to splashdown, the Navy will deploy small boats and launch helicopters as we are monitoring intercommunications from the MCC to ensure that those local assets are safe as harbor falls out of the sky on the Jettison Harbor that comes off the capsule. Once it splashes down, um, while Judd is monitoring the DFTO that he mentioned before for thermal soak back and the vehicle still powered, we're doing a couple of different things that we're focusing on. We're getting ready to recover the Jettison hardware, trying to get to it before it sinks. Uh, we're also performing an angel beacon test, which is the beacon that will be on the astronaut suit and comparing that to the crew module beacon signature to make sure that they're discernible from the satellite. Um, and Goddard Space Flight Center folks are on board to do that. And we're doing a hazard assessment of the capsule from the helicopters to make sure that everything is nominal and there's nothing visible prior to bringing the capsule into the ship. Um, once we're done with all of those assessments and the DFTO is complete and power down happens and Jed formally hands the vehicle over to the local team, the, we'll do a hazard assessment, um, the divers will as they approach the capsule. 
and then we will do um, imagery and data gathering underwater and above water to ensure that the sea condition is documented post splashdown prior to um, bringing it into the well deck of the ship. Once that's complete, the ship will approach, attach lines, and we will put the crew module in the well deck and set it down into a cradle. Um, once the spacecraft is secured, engineers will begin analyzing the capsule and taking additional pictures. And at that time, we will start our transit back to port, which will be delayed a day due to the fact that we had to transit um, 300 nautical miles south of the weather alternate. This team has done a lot of training and practicing to bring us to this point, and it's an honor to be leading the team that brings Orion home. Thank you, Melissa. We'll now move into the question and answer portion of today's briefing. And a reminder, if you're on the phone, please press star one to raise your hand to ask a question, and star two if your question has been asked and answered. We're gonna start here in the room. Um, we'll start on this side. Hi, Eric Berger uh, with Ars Technica. A question about the skip entry. Just wondering from a overall mission standpoint, maybe a question for Mike, I'm not sure. Um, why this architecture, why this return profile was chosen for, for the Artemis missions and how important it is to demonstrate it on this first mission for future crew missions? Yeah, Eric, uh, thank you for the question. I'll I'll uh, ask Jim for some help on this one since he's he's been with the Orion program longer than I have. but. You know, fundamentally, the uh, the skip reentry has a lower G profile than a direct or ballistic reentry, and and the uh, the amount of deceleration that you put, not only on the spacecraft but but the passengers, the astronauts riding on board, was was a key consideration. Uh, Jim, if you have any other thoughts, you were part of some of the original trades. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Mike. That's a great question. Another important aspect of the skip entry is it allows us to target a single landing site regardless of when you launch during the mission. Um, so by varying what we call the azimuth, the direction at which the, the crew module flies back to the target, we're always able to narrow our operations to that um, landing zone which Judd described earlier. If you compare that back to the Apollo missions where the U.S. Navy was deployed all over the, the Pacific Ocean, this helps both from an operational and an efficiency standpoint by always um, targeting the same spot. Does it increase risk, the sort of the additional maneuvering, or is that just wondering, like, kind of coming down, going up, going down? Dumb question, but I'm just, it seems like it, that it makes it a little bit more complex. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, you got to take all the energy out of the uh, out of the spacecraft that was put into it earlier. Uh, this is just one way of doing it. Again, skip reentry as opposed to um, the uh, direct or ballistic down mode. Uh, it's just a different profile in terms of heat rate and heat impulse that comes out of the vehicle. Um, but all of that needs to come out. The heat shield needs to perform regardless of which profile uh, we fly, and this vehicle is prepared to fly any of those. Um, in terms of risk, you know, there are uh, role maneuvers required to execute this. Um, the vehicle um, gets aerodynamic capture. It's stable once it gets aerodynamic capture. The role is simply just changing the lift vector. So in terms of risk, I, I would say it's a marginal to no increase yeah, in risk. I would say marginal to no. I mean, we did the same kind of thing on shuttle where we do roll reversals to, to, to target specific points, right? So the, the avionics, modern avionics for, for guidance are, are really accurate in, in, from that perspective. Okay, uh, next question in the room. Gina Sinceri, ABC News, this is for Judd. So you've got a range up and down the coast of California. You could go north or south, and tell me why south. I'm a little confused uh, exactly where you're coming down. Could you explain that to me? Sure. Uh, thanks, Gina. The, so uh, if you throw up that uh, slide again that shows the 2D, 2D map, uh, I can explain it to you. So uh, when we deorbited from the moon on RPF, we set our entry interface target to that point that's at the bottom uh, of the screen, right? So, uh, and, and so therefore, the only, only possible way we can go is either continue on uh, up that trajectory as far as our energy allows, 
or we can go shorter. We can dissipate more energy and, and, and land shorter, right? So, so by modulating uh, our, our lift vector with this skip entry profile, we have the full range. We can go all the way to San Diego and even a little bit further by, by essentially lofting more and, 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 and going uh, a little bit further, or we can modulate our lift vector that's, that's that we, we kind of bury it in the earth and we go straight down, right? So, so those are our only possibilities. We don't have a lot of cross-range capability. We can't go left or right uh, significantly. We, we use that uh, capability left or right to, to, to really modulate our downrange capabilities. Does that, does that answer your question? Sure. All right, our next question in the room. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mark Corot with uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. I think this is for Mike. Um, <clears throat> in, in the previous two briefings, you've talked about adding some uh, uh, objectives that you could do because of the performance and the success of the mission along the way. I wonder if anything at this point has sort of jumped out and and just sort of struck you as, boy, this is a good thing we had the opportunity to do it. I mean, there's probably several, but I just wonder if there's anything that just really rises. Uh, Mark, thank you for the question. The, um, the one that kind of pops to my mind was the uh, thermal characterization of the vehicle. Um, you know, we have uh, essentially a 20 degree by 20 degree box that the, the vehicle wants to fly about tail to sun. And, and the team asked to um, fly kind of the edges of the box to, to see, you know, do, do certain components on the vehicle get hot. Uh, we know we need to protect star trackers. Uh, we know that uh, cameras can get hot that are mounted externally. And overall, the vehicles perform very well um, in terms of therm thermal characterization. And, and when we set up for the flight initially, I think we were looking at what, like a two degree attitude um, box R within that 20 degree um, envelope that we uh, said that the vehicle was designed and certified to fly. And now that we've explored that, it, it shows that we've got a lot more uh, flexibility operationally. And that becomes more important when you start looking at downstream missions for things like rendezvous and proximity operations, where you may have to, um, you know, if you're the chaser vehicle and you're approaching a target vehicle, uh, and you have to be in that that uh, out of out of that attitude for an extended period of time, it affords some flexibility operationally, and um, also for mated operations. If if the vehicle that you're mated with or docked with, for example, on future flights with Gateway, um, has an issue that you want to help them out, it tells us that we've got a little flexibility there as well. So the thermal characterization and, and going after that, we had additional propellant to do it. We are well above the, uh, the uh, margins required to complete the, uh, the normal mission. We've got over a ton of extra propellant on the vehicle right now to do that. So this was just a wise use of, of understanding um, our models and how the flight environment matched the modeling and, and it helped us buy down some of those uncertainties. So that was the one that comes to mind for me. Okay, we'll now move to questions on the phone bridge. A reminder, if you're on the phone, please state your name and affiliation and to whom your question is directed. First, we'll start with Robert Perlman and Collect Space. Hi, um, this question is probably for all four panel members because it's somewhat subjective, but to try to put this, what we're going into here with the re-entry into some historical context, it was mentioned we're on the Apollo 17 anniversary. It happens to be that when we land on Sunday, um, back on Earth, it'll be the 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon uh, for Apollo 17. What would you, how would you categorize what, the, which is the bigger challenge, bringing back a new spacecraft to Earth for the first time or landing on the moon for the sixth time but in a new place that you hadn't been before? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that one and we'll work our way down. Um, you know, Robert, I, this is my 65th mission um, supporting human space flight. And, uh, and flight testing is my jam. I, I love flight testing. And um, I would say that the first time you do anything is, is harder than a repeat. Um, but that is not um, accounting for new changes or new objectives or, or harder objectives that, that occur on later flights. So that's, it's a difficult question to answer because I know Apollo 17 uh, was one of the farthest off the, uh, the equator at, um, for the moon relative to the Apollo um, 
landing sites and, and uh, the farther you get away from the equator for the, for the Apollo architecture, um, that made that a, a much more difficult uh, mission to accomplish. So, you know, just in general, I would say firsts are harder um, because you, you almost don't know what you don't know. Um, but as you get more and more complex missions like Apollo 17 was, um, it, that, that becomes a very uh, challenging question, the answer. I don't know, Judd, what your thoughts are. Uh, so the way I'd answer that question is, is uh, you know, as an operator, uh, we've practiced these same, same kind of operations over and over again in simulations, right? So by the time we get to uh, actually performing the actual um, operation, we've done it so many times, we've practiced it in failure sc scenarios, uh, it, it in many respects feels like we've done this many times before. Uh, so, so what I, I would say from my perspective, uh, the way we, we mitigate any first time uh, actions uh, is, is we practice over and over again uh, such that uh, we, we, we make sure that we know um, in certain failure scenarios, what we're gonna do, uh, we have that outlined in, in our mission rules and procedures, and so uh, we, we, we expect the unexpected in many, many respects. Yeah, I think this is a good reminder that Artemis One is a test flight. No matter how good or how many d design analyses you do, tests you do on, on Earth-based facilities, there's no perfect replication for flying in space. We've already demonstrated there are some differences uh, between the ground and flight. And we've used the, the onboard instrumentation to collect data, or downlink that to Earth, and we're learning from the mission. So again, it, it is a test flight, and doing it for the first time, you learn things that um, you, you just didn't anticipate. All right. Melissa, do you want to take a crack at that one as well? Um, and we were wondering, Melissa, if you would want to speak to that as well. Okay, we'll move on to the next question with Chris Davenport and the Washington Post. Hi, thanks so much, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear, can me? hear you, yes. Okay, great. Um, I guess it's for Mike or, or Judd. There's been a lot of talk of, about testing of the heat shield coming from the lunar uh, reentry trajectory, but less, I feel, about the, uh, the parachute, parachutes, and I'm just wondering how you're feeling about them, if you have any concerns, or if you think you retired the risk associated with the shoots uh, during the EFT-1 mission. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I will say that um, you know parachutes, uh, in terms of overall mission risk, it, it is on the um, on the top risk drivers in, in, in what we call the Pareto chart um, that shows like our top 25 risk drivers. Um, so there there is definitely some risk there associated with the uh, parachute deployment and and um, and subsonic descent and and um, deceleration of the vehicle. That said, the program. And, and Jim can speak to the specifics. The program put in considerable effort uh, to uh, develop, test, and certify the parachute systems, specifically at the Yuma Proving Grounds, uh, with our with our partners um, out out at Yuma, um, to buy down that risk. And and I I feel like that risk has been well characterized. They did um, high altitude, the the normal altitude, low altitude deploys. Uh, sh uh, single parachute uh, uh, failure cases, and and all of that has has been well characterized. Um, we understand that there is some res residual risk there, um, but uh, you know that said, I, I think we we understand it. I don't know, Jim, if you have anything to add to that one, I think that's a great answer and a great question. Uh, as you described, the Orion program did a very robust series of tests out at Yuma. Uh, 47 total uh, drop tests in different configurations, ranging from uh, uh, demonstration articles up to uh, full-scale, um, complete sequence tests. And also, as mentioned, the EFT-1 was a, a, f a flight demonstration returning from space, and the parachute system operated perfectly. So while there remains risk in parachute systems at all times, uh, I think we've characterized the performance and the, the risks very well and are prepared for, 
for anything that may come. All right, our next question is from Christopher Mick with the Hudson Star Observer. Hello, Christopher Mick, uh, Hudson Star Observer. Thank you for taking my question. I believe this would be for Mike. Um, I wanted to ask if there's any kind of anticipated timeline on when the, the data recorders on board the capsule, the dosimeters and whatnot, and when that information might be made public. Uh, Christopher, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of the uh, dosimeter data being made public, I do not have a date on that. I, I know for a fact that um, we need to get the uh, spacecraft back to the Kennedy Space Center, which will happen in the late December, and then we'll start removing uh, the dosimeters and the payloads and, and a whole host of things, including the uh, the mannequins, the seat accelerometers, and, and a number of um, you know, uh, biometric and, and other um, uh, microphone data and other things that are in the cabin. Um, in terms of a specific release of that, I think we would have to follow up with you on that one. Okay, our next question is from Mike Wall with space.com. Thank you all for doing this. Um, just a quick question, I mean, it looks like, like during the reentry, like Orion's gonna be pretty far off off the west coast of both South America and North America, but like, is there any chance any folks along those coasts might be able to see it like in the sky as it's coming back in? And um, just a quick question too about what's gonna happen after splashdown. Could you just give us a quick rundown of kind of when it's gonna get back to shore and I mean, what, what the plans are, like just, just sort of after recovery and in, in like sort of broad strips? Sure, thanks Mike, um, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, as far as, um, is anybody gonna be able to see that uh, off Baja? Uh, there's always a chance, but we're pretty far off the coast uh, there, so uh, I, I doubt it unless you're out in a, in a boat, uh, you know, uh, 100 miles offshore or so. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, what's gonna happen after we enter, uh, so as I mentioned, once we splash down, we'll, we'll stay um, in a powered configuration for two hours. Uh, for that soak back uh, test, and also as as Melissa mentioned, the Angel uh, uh, Beacon tests as well. Uh, once uh, we power down the vehicle, we'll hand that over to Melissa and her team. And if she's not online anymore, I probably can 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 talk a little bit about um, you know what what she does. Uh, so uh, she will she will then uh, it'll take them about six you know four to six hours or so to get the capsule back in the well deck, uh, and then uh, once those uh, operations are complete, they'll head back uh, towards San Diego and that'll again take them about a day or so uh, to get uh, back into port and uh, and then uh, they have a timeline to get that uh, back to, to uh, Kennedy and I think that's around uh, you know a couple of weeks or so yeah and Mike the only thing to add is um, you know it will be daylight during the uh, during the reentry so seeing a reentry vehicle um, during the daylight is definitely more difficult than at night. Um, you're, you're more likely to hear the sonic boom um, as the vehicle uh, approaches than anything. Okay, and just a note for anyone preparing to ask a question, we do not have contact with Melissa Jones right now. She is uh, virtual and on the ship preparing for splashdown, so we're working to regain that signal, but in the meantime, uh, you'll have these guys. So next question we have is from Leo Inright with Irish TV. Thanks very much, Julia. I, I was wondering how are you assessing the risk of a collision uh, with another object uh, on the way in at lunar return speeds. Uh, it, it was really striking that you had three dozen COLA um, cutouts during a two-hour launch window. So I'm just wondering, you know, how big a worry is it uh, coming back in that, uh, you know, something could happen? And, of course, that problem it, you know, there was a launch just uh, 10 minutes ago out of Cape Canaveral of, a, of another constellation. So this problem is going to increase for human missions. I'm just wondering how you assess it. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, so we do assess that, right? So we have uh, the current state of the vehicle and what its uh, uh, path is going to be along the Earth's surface. We also uh, work in concert with uh, US STRATCOM uh, to, uh, to assess. They have a catalog of all of the objects that are in low Earth orbit. And, uh, and so we have them doing a screening against our trajectory versus all of the other ones. Uh, the good news is uh, there's only 
two objects that uh, we we are tracking right now uh, as we're coming uh, into uh, uh, entry interface as uh, being anything that's anywhere near uh, the box, and those probability of collisions are essentially zero. Uh, we are moving as, uh, essentially perpendicular to all the rest of those objects, and we're, we're, we're traveling extremely fast. Uh, as far as uh, why we had so many uh, on launch day, well, we're starting from zero speed, and we're starting to go through all of that, uh, uh, those objects in space. And so, uh, you know, depending on when we launch, uh, we make sure that we have a low probability of hitting all of those. Uh, and and does, just because uh, we had these these cola, you know, um, cutouts doesn't mean that there are a lot, necessarily a lot of objects that we're going to hit. It just happened they, they to line up with those uh, uh, the times that we were planning to launch, right? So I, I would say that's that's also low risk. Uh, it's it's actually quite a big space uh, out there. Next question is from Jeff Faust with Space News. Good afternoon. Question for Mike, just sort of an update from some of the earlier briefings. Where are you in terms of percentage complete on objectives and percentage still in progress? Thanks. Yeah, Jeff, uh, thank you for the question. Um, from the baseline objectives, you know, again, we, we, we completed the first half of Priority 1. We'll realize the second half of Priority 1 on, on, um, on Splashdown Day. Priorities two and four, which are demonstrate the vehicle in the flight environment, and then uh, what we call the the uh, bonus objectives associated with science, technology, and and um, and just outreach. Um, there's 124 objectives in combination there. Um, we are over 30 percent complete in the um, in those objectives. Um, we're about 37 and a half percent complete, uh, or 37 and a half percent in progress. And that is because we continue to take data, and we're going to continue to take data until we get up to the return trajectory correction uh, maneuver number five, uh, just uh, shy of two, day, uh, two days from now. Um, so, you know, we are on the eighth and ninth out of ten data takes on those uh, for things like optical navigation data takes and star tracker thermal um, data takes and a, and a whole host of other objectives. And then some of those uh, we will not realize, that the remainder we will not realize until entry, descent, landing, and splashdown. Um, and then there's one or two that uh, it's really kind of a post-flight thing, like corrosion monitoring on the vehicle. Uh, just the fact that we've splashed down um, kind of initiates it, but the actual uh, closure of that objective uh, doesn't occur until after the uh, the mission, and, and we uh, remove the witness samples to, uh, to understand um, uh, what the salt water environment did to the vehicle at splashdown. So we continue to make good progress. Um, that's that's where we're at. It may not sound like we've um, uh, moved the uh, the meter that much since what we uh, had previously talked. But again, we continue to do uh, more and more data takes. We've also added um, uh, 14 uh, what I'll call new objectives in the course of the mission. And um, the bulk of those are complete. We're, we're complete through 10 of those, and four of those are, are either through multiple data takes or we've got a couple of them um, that we have yet to start. So uh, we're, we're kind of above the 124 that, that we talked um, prior to the mission. We've added 14 since then. And then um, priority three, we'll realize that one when we, when we splash down and recover the vehicle. All right, our next question is from David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Thanks, everybody. Uh, in the last briefing, and I'm not sure who was talking about it, it was about uh, after recovery of uh, protecting the heat shield. So once it's in the well deck, can you just give me a, a short explainer of how you're going to uh, isolate the vehicle so that you don't damage uh, the heat shield at that point so you can get a, a great um, data from it? Thank you. Yeah, David. Um if Melissa's on, um, she can answer that one. Otherwise, I'll take a crack at it. You can go. Okay. Um, so when when the vehicle splashes down, um, it's it's buoyant. It sits there in the in the uh, ocean water. Um, in order to protect it, uh, you know, one of the one of the first things we do is to flood the well deck past the uh, past the point where if there's any wave action. That it's not that the um, the heat shield is not going to contact the uh, the base of the well deck. Um, then once the uh, the spacecraft is past what they call the stern gate, which is basically the back end of the of the ship, they close the stern gate, and it basically isolates the uh, the ocean and the wave action from the ocean from the well deck itself. 
So now you literally only have the ship by itself with the water inside of it uh, with the stern gate closed. And then uh, they position it over what they call a recovery cradle. And the recovery cradle um, has uh, some uh, rubberized material that is uh, basically conformed to the, to the shape of the base heat shield. And then they, they basically position the spacecraft over that recovery cradle and then drain the well deck while they're holding it over that position and literally low it, lower it down onto a, a perfectly uh, conformed um, uh, a cradle a base. And then that is, that is how we protect the heat shield. Our next question is from Marsha Smith with Space Policy Online. Thanks so much. Uh, Mike, could you review again what weather criteria were violated at the uh, original landing sites? Was it wind or sea state or rain or what exactly was it? And what will the weather be at the point where you are going to splash down? And can you tell us what the coordinates are of the splashdown site or is 100 miles west of Guadalupe Island the closest you can tell us? Yeah, Marcia, thank you for the question. Um, the, uh, the coordinates, uh, we, are, we are not at liberty to share that um, uh, based on um, uh, guidance we've been given by our, our U.S. Navy uh, counterparts. Um, there's, there's, that's, that's what I'll say on that one. Uh, Judd described the, uh, the area that we're talking about. Um, in terms of the weather criteria that was violated, um, we have this cold front moving in uh, into the, the very southern California area, um, and right where the um, um, the normal landing site is, it is going to set up and or come through in the same time frame that we're looking to splash down. Um, and Closer in the shore, which is some of, of the what we call the northern weather alternate uh, sites, we are expecting uh, light precipitation. So, so rain uh, is is part of the criteria. We don't want to fly the spacecraft through rain or have descent um, uh, and splash down through rain. Uh, in addition to that, with the cold front moving through, uh, we are going to have an increase in winds, and then the winds are going to whip up the waves. So uh, the uh, the wave height that we're allowed to uh, recover is up to uh, six feet, but there's also a uh, a wave period that is that is uh, of consideration. Uh, the waves are going to get choppier as the wind picks up as the as the front moves through, and the recovery operation takes several hours. So um, while the spacecraft uh, could splash down in that in that area because the winds are forecast kind of right at the right at the uh, the max of um, what the design limits are which is at 20 knots uh, the forecast was around 17 to 20 knots um, in in the uh, in the planned landing zone a little bit south of where the rain is uh, is forecast um, the the spacecraft design would probably be okay uh, the um, the uh, recovery operation may get challenging because of the uh, the wave um, action being uh, kicked up by the uh, by the winds and again it's a, a multiple hour operation so there was an uncertainty zone in there for the um, for the weather forecast and we moved south of the uncertainty zone and that's that's why we got to where we got so it was a combination of of rain winds and wave height all right our next question is from nadia drake with scientific american Thank you so much. Um, I think this question is for Mike. Um, you've told us about the issues that you've encountered so far on this flight, um, including an early problem with the star tracker, uh, the funnies, quote unquote, with the power conditioning and distribution unit, um, and the Goldstone Deep Space Network going down this past weekend. And I'm curious, um, what, if anything, would you say is the most significant or the most concerning issue that you've encountered so far? Um, does anything rise to the top? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Nadia. Um, the most significant thing I would say is the vehicle is performing as designed, and and in spite of some of the challenges that we've seen with uh, you know some of these uh, uh, latching current limiters on the on the power conditioning and distribution system, and and uh, in spite of uh, some of the glitches that we've seen with radiation hits on on some of the equipment, the uh, the system design and, and robustness is handling it uh, just fine. Uh, and, and that is partly because the system's autocorrect, 
but also because we have our operations team that is that is here in Mission Control that is uh, identifying these and in short order getting the vehicle back to a normal configuration. Um, of those that we that we encountered, the one that we um, don't fully understand are the uh, uncommanded open uh, indications on the latching current limiters, which is part of our power system. Uh, that is a uh, an anomalous feature, and I think we're up to 17 occurrences of, of this occurring throughout the course of the mission, plus the, uh, the four uh, feeder uh, current limiters that opened um, a couple of days ago, um, all, all in close proximity that drops some downstream power loads. Uh, that is the one thing that the team is, is really um, working hard to understand. Uh, we have yet to achieve a, a root cause on that, and the, and the team um, is, is going through a series of actions to try to isolate, is it on the battery-fed part of the power system, is it on the solar array? Fed power of the side of the solar uh, the uh, power system is it on side A of the system is it on side B of the system so they're methodically working through it and 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 in spite of all that effort uh, we have yet to clearly identify a root cause so um, I hope that answers your question. Our next question is from Joey Roulette with Reuters. Hey, thank you. Um, Sorry if I missed this before, but um, could you, I guess for Mike, uh, could you like explain what some of the most important objectives, bonus objectives um, are that you guys added during this mission? And also for Mike or anyone else who wants to answer it, um, just kind of like explain, you know, what the importance and or difficulty associated with, you know, meeting this re-entry objective is. I mean, it's, it's obviously different from a spacecraft entering through the atmosphere from LEO, and, and I guess kind of explain those differences and how different it is coming from the moon instead. Thanks. Um, yeah, Joey, thank you for the questions. Um, in, in terms of the, the most important um, uh, bonus objectives, um, they're, they're all important in their, their own way. Um, some of them have helped us understand um, where there's margin. Uh, in terms of either the the uh, coolant system or the uh, thermal system, some of them have helped us understand kind of alternate means of attitude control uh, and uh, potentially some propellant savings measures that could be implemented on future flights, um, and then also uh, so to help us understand kind of some what ifs if we were to see those on future flights, like a. Uh, a uh, gaseous nitrogen leak on the uh, Orion main engine, um, you know, what that, what that would mean to uh, loss of mission success, um, you know, should we, should we see a, um, a uh, valve that doesn't indicate properly um, how we might find an alternative means of doing that. So those things are, are, are a high bar to demonstrate on the ground because you need a lot of systems, you need the the uh, controllers, the effectors, you need the uh, propellant, you need the nitrogen, you need the proper thermal conditions to set all these things up. It, it is easier to demonstrate those things on the flight vehicle in order to, to characterize and buy down and understand um, your, your margins, um, but also uh, what your likelihood on future missions of having a loss of mission or a loss of vehicle um, are. And, and the team has, has done a fantastic job of, of identifying where there is extra time, extra propellant to, to buy down these risks moving forward. So, so um, I wouldn't say any one, one is any more important than the other. Uh, now, obviously, if what we demonstrated on this flight helps save the next mission, that becomes very important. Uh, we may never see some of these things on future missions. We may never need that extra propellant. We may never need uh, the uh, the. Um, uh, indication uh, on the, on the uh, Orion main engine because the, the indicators uh, may work just fine, um, but we're testing the system and we're understanding and characterizing it. In terms of uh, the, your second question on the importance of meeting the reentry uh, objective, um, it is our priority one objective, and it is our priority one objective for a reason. Uh, there is no arc jet or aerothermal facility here on Earth capable of replicating hypersonic reentry with a, uh, a heat shield of this size, and it is a brand new heat shield design, and this block AVCO design. Um, and, and it is a safety critical piece of equipment. It is designed to protect the spacecraft and the passengers, the astronauts on board. Uh, so the heat shield needs to work. 
and uh, we can buy down some of that risk on the ground, but in terms of, of coming back at, at Mach 32, and in terms of uh, taking out the amount of heat and approaching temperatures of 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for as long as we need uh, in order to, to bring a 20,000 pound spacecraft with astronauts on board is not something we can do on the ground. So it is, that's, that's why it's our priority one objective. All right. And those are all of the questions that I'm seeing for today. So thank you to everyone who joined and asked questions. I think we all know what's coming up next, and that is Splashdown on Sunday, December 11th. Our live coverage will begin at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Central, and we expect Splashdown around 12.40 p.m. Eastern. Following Splashdown, we will have a briefing at about uh, no earlier than 3.30 p.m. Eastern. But we just want to thank you again for joining us for Orion's incredible journey around the moon and its journey back to home so far. Uh, but with that, that will wrap it up for us today here at Johnson Space Center. Go Artemis. Well, in my left hand, I have a...